Well, good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you would join us here at Colonial Church. I'll just say that I'm still not used to the fact that we're doing this by ourselves. It's on Tuesday afternoon and we're projecting into your homes for Sunday. But know that we have prayerfully thought about it this week. We have prepared ourselves. God has met us in the midst of that preparation. And now we together in these moments that you're watching where the church gathered together in Jesus' name to worship and celebrate all of God's grace and mercy and love for us. So a welcome, welcome to worship today, people of God. Let's pause and reflect over our past week and then I invite you to join me in the Congregational Book of Worship's Prayer. Pray with me. God of all grace, pour forth your Holy Spirit in this, our time of worship, and also in our daily lives, that we may have strength of which the world knows not, that we may be led into all truth, and that in the midst of our earthly trials and uncertainties, we may have the peace that passes all understanding. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, my friends, we begin this journey of Advent. It's the first Sunday of Advent. And as you can see, the Advent wreath is here again in all of its glory. I invite you as we think about the Advent journey leading us to Christmas, that you ponder each week what each one of these candles means and what that represents in our lives as we preach ourselves through these ideas. So join me. We light this candle to proclaim the coming of the light of God into the world. Because of this coming of this light, there is hope because of Christ. Because of Christ, we not only have hope, but we believe that good is stronger than evil. God wants us to work for good in this world.
I'm so grateful that we are now in the season of Advent and we're very excited about lots that's happening in the life of this church right now. I have some great, great news. We've hired a new children's ministry associate. His name is George Dornbach and he now joins the Emerging, emerging Generations team under the direction of Andrew Zhao. We're so excited to get to know George and we're going to try to get to know him better in the next week. So kids, parents, maybe you have some questions for George. Keep an eye out for an email from Andrew Zhao and an idea of how you can send a question to George so George can answer that question and you can get to know him better. We are so excited. He starts December 7th and we will begin ministry with him in the days to come. So exciting, so exciting. We continue our series uh, on faith and justice. And this week, it, what does it mean to follow Jesus into the lives of our neighbors? So I invite you into that conversation. Uh, it's uh, December 1st uh, from 6.30 to 8 o'clock on Zoom. You can see the Zoom ID there. Our call is clear. God loves and champions the cause of the oppressed. And we're meant to be the image of God by doing the same. So join us in this conversation as we continue to explore these themes of racial justice and the lack of it at times. We'll uncover more deeply what we mean when we use the phrase systematic racism, both in our political system and inside the church, and explore what it means to work for the deep justice that makes the coming of God's kingdom. And we get to be a part of that. So join that conversation. I invite you. And then lastly, we want you to make sure that you know all of what's happening in the life of this church, especially when it comes to Christmas. So head to www.colonialchurch.org slash Christmas, and you'll begin to see all of what's happening in the weeks to come. There are so many ways to see the light, to share the light, to bring the light this Advent season. We can't wait for you to partake with us as we partake alongside you. So... Welcome to worship and welcome to all of what's happening in the life of this church. Good morning, friends. We're going to pray now. And during these challenging times, we don't rush into prayer. Sometimes it helps just to catch our breath, focus our thoughts and our hearts as we pray. So let's do that right now. I invite you to pray with me. Our Lord, creator of all, source of all life, giver of hope and healing, constant companion on the way. We look to you these challenging days. Many are tired, weary, and stretched beyond our strength. You're not surprised. You don't worry. You know what resources can help. So we ask you to make it clear to us what you have in mind how you want us to respond and address our own needs and the stresses in the world around us. We face these dark days of the spiking pandemic. We experience deep divisions all around, in the world, in our country, in our community, and even in our church and families. Bring us together by your spirit. Give us a new start. May we reimagine who we are and who we can become together. Rekindle in us the resolve to follow you and become like you. And let the people around us know what you have done for us and what you mean to us and what you could bring to them. And may we continually learn that we have the capacity to change the things that are important to us that you never give up on us, that you are constantly with us. Provide your courage and comfort. Be for us healing and strength. Lead us to rely on you for all we need, for all you promise. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in this Advent season, may we focus on you, our star of hope, our prince of peace, our source of love, and the joy of life. Amen. Now we pray for members of our community who are going through challenges and changes. 
Prayers of healing for Polly Patrick, for Ali Zomer, Carol Wachter, Rob Davidson, Harland Erickson, Steve Colby, David Yates, Bob Gubrud, Steve Richardson, Rita Dauka, Dick Kuyath, and Richard Buckland. And we pray for our mission ministry for this month, the Pilgrim Center for Reconciliation, that God would help them to bring reconciliation among people so they can be peace builders and witnesses for the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. I invite you now to pray with me together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, I offer you the blessing of the peace of Christ. May you find strength for whatever you are facing. May you find joy even in the challenges of these days. And I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to whoever comes to your mind right now. A hug if they're in the same room. A phone call, a text, or a note could be a wonderful thing, could mean so much. So let's pass it on whenever you're able. Hey, it's time in the service for the children's sermon, one of my favorite parts of the worship. Because I'm preaching, I get a chance to share a few thoughts with you. So kids, I want to invite you to, to come a little closer and and lean into your TV screen and, and listen to a few things I want to share with you. Wait, what's that you're thinking? Why does Pastor Jeff have a blue string on his finger? It's a very good observation and very good question. You know, when I was young, maybe I was about your age, my mother said to me, if you're trying to remember something, just tie a string around your finger and, and it'll help you remember. Sometimes I remember I had the string on my finger, but I couldn't remember why I had the string on my finger. So it kind of worked. Sometimes we write things down on pieces of paper. Sometimes we take out our phones and we jot things into the notes. Sometimes we put them on our computers. There's lots of ways to try to remember things. There's a lot of important things to remember. To do the things that your parents tell you to do. To follow through with some of your friends to remember to watch your favorite show or to brush your teeth at night. There's lots of important things to remember and lots of ways we can use to help us to remember. You know, you've already heard in the service today that it's Advent. It's the season that we're waiting for Jesus to come. And we have something that helps us to remember that. It's right here. It's right here in the meeting house. It's called the Advent wreath. I want to talk to you about that a little bit. The Advent wreath. We already lit, already lit one of the candles. Do you remember that? So I want to invite you guys. Wait, you're too far away. Come closer. No, no, come closer. This is the Advent wreath. It's the wreath that's here to help us be a part of the season of Christmas. We light five different candles each week leading up to Christmas to remind us of what Jesus has done for each of us coming into the world. First as a baby, grew up to be a man. And of course, we know the rest of the story, right? He died and rose again so that we might have new life. The candles, hope and peace and love and joy. And the big one in the middle, can you see how that one's just a little bit bigger? That's the Christ candle. That's the Jesus candle. As we light these candles, they get brighter and brighter and brighter. And the reason for that is because Jesus is the light of the world. And in Jesus, we have hope. That's what the first candle of Advent is, hope. It's the expectation of something to come. Well, Advent reminds us that we celebrate Jesus' coming. He's come. 
He's come that we may have hope and experience all the rest of what it means to be loved by Jesus. So, welcome to Advent. I hope that you'll maybe think about some ways that you can remember that Christmas is much more than just what we do on Christmas morning. It's all of what Jesus continues to do in all of our lives. So God, I ask that you would be with these children as they now journey with us together to Christmas, remembering that in Jesus we have hope and peace and love and joy because of Jesus, because of you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our inspired word of God comes today from the pen of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 33, verses 14 through 17. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for this time to gather with your people. To look now into the next month, this season of Advent, where we remember this great story of how history changed forever. And so, as we journey together on this journey of Advent, we invite you to join us, to lead us, to guide us, to help us discern your truth in the midst of it all, that we might grow closer to you. For we pray this in your name. Amen. It's that time of year again. You can tell. Look at the meeting house. The, the trees are here. The poinsettias are here. The advent wreath is here. The meeting house is lined with evergreen, with lights. And there are wreaths hanging all around this space. It's advent. Snow's been on the ground. Christmas music is beginning to be played on the radio. Christmas lights, including my own home, are popping up everywhere. Christmas trees here in the meeting house and in a few houses in the neighborhood. And we as Christians start out the season of the year here in the church called Advent. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it means the coming of the Savior. It's a holy season of the Christian church that marks a period of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the birth of Jesus, also known as the season of Christmas. The church is decorated properly like it always has been, with the greenery everywhere representing the evergreen of hope and peace and love and joy and of the coming of the Lord. The liturgical color is purple, signifying great royalty in the coming of our Lord. And the Advent candles in our wreath represent a journey, a journey each week bringing us closer and closer to Bethlehem. Today's the first Sunday in Advent, a Sunday represented by our first candle, the candle of hope. As we lit this first candle of the Advent wreath, we've begun a trek, venturing forward with those shepherds towards that little town of Bethlehem. And the message of the morning, the message of the candles being lit, the message of the hearts and lips of the shepherds beginning their journey, and the message we should be focused on because we so need to, is the message of hope, a great hope. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I have to ask a quick question of clarification. What does 
hope. What does the word hope mean to you? What is our hope? It's a term that can so easily be thrown around. I hope we have a white Christmas because it's not guaranteed. I hope the Vikings win. Not a guarantee. I hope we will soon have an answer to this epidemic. I hope my family and I stay safe. But that is not the kind of hope that is represented by the lone candle burning brightly this Sunday. <clears throat> the hope represented by the candle is a much greater, much grander hope. It represents, the, it represents the hope of an entire nation. It represents the anticipation of God's promised faithfulness for the entire world. It represents something that you and I can often take for granted. So will we? Will we take it for granted again this year? There once was a manufacturer of shoes who sent two salespersons to a faraway land. Shortly after their arrival, the owner of the company received an email from each of the salespeople. One pleaded, get me out of here. No one wears shoes. The other requested, send me more inventory. Everyone needs shoes. A funny story. In today's passage, the prophet Jeremiah is kind of like the salesperson requesting more shoes. He offers the people of Judah and Jerusalem a message of hope, beginning with the words, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And yet, ironically, Jeremiah seems most of the time to have been more like the first salesperson, not at all hopeful. The message of hope is almost out of sync for Jeremiah in that the circumstances were most likely anything but hopeful for him. Jeremiah was probably serving time in jail because he prophesied that the king Zedekiah and the people of Judah and Jerusalem charging them with being unfaithful to the Lord and the covenant that God had with them. To add insult to injury, Jeremiah had said that the present attack on Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar and his Babylonian army was God's instrument of punishment upon the people of Judah and Jerusalem because of their unfaithfulness. He said, it's pointless to resist. It's not just this army you're fighting, but you're fighting against God who has promised to be with you. Such a prophetic message would have gone over like a lead balloon. No wonder Jeremiah was in jail. And yet, Jeremiah remains faithful to God and proclaims this message of hope in spite of the immediate situation of hopelessness. The days are surely coming, Jeremiah prophesies, when the Messiah shall come to rule with justice and righteousness. It's difficult for people to live without hope. And yet, as someone once said, where there's life, there's hope, and where there's hope, there's life. Jeremiah is speaking into a difficult situation and circumstance, offering real hope. Several years ago, Desmond Tutu, Bishop of South Africa, wrote a book called Hope and Suffering. It was a very fitting title and true to life in his country at the time when people were dragged down by the apartheid regime. Bishop Tutu and other Christian leaders were proclaiming oracles of hope. Life in South Africa would change. The days are surely coming. Don't lose hope. Don't give up on life, Bishop Tutu would say. Bishop Tutu himself lived that message of hope and inspired hundreds of thousands of his native country to do just the same. And lo and behold, that hope in the midst of suffering gave birth to new life. The apartheid regime came to an end and a multicultural, multiracial nation 
united to live and work for peace and justice, forgiveness and love for all South Africans. Hope. Hope that drives us forward. In our world today, there is so many reasons to live without hope. All around us, there is so much suffering due to the pandemic, not to mention all the struggles that existed before COVID. And we wonder, is there any hope? Is hope real? Or is it only a dream? Is hope just about wishing, hoping things will come true? Or is there a certain hope somewhere that we can point to? The days are surely coming, says Jeremiah. And as we begin a new church year with this first Sunday of Advent, we look forward to those coming days of waiting and watching and longing and hoping for a Messiah King, for new life and for a new beginning, for justice and love, peace and joy among all people. Jeremiah declares hope is real, and it's perhaps most real in the midst of suffering and hopelessness. Whether it's the people of Judah and Jerusalem under attack by the Babylonians, whether it's the troubled spots in the world today, whether it's the sick or poor or homeless or unemployed or those being discriminated against, the days are surely coming when a Savior, the Messiah King, shall be born shall grow up and live, shall teach and preach, shall work miracles, shall face cruel suffering and meet a criminal's death at the hands of a corrupt and powerful nation. And he shall be raised from the dead three days after death and promises to live with us and through us forever. Such is our hope. Yesterday, today, forever. This is the message of hope to and for suffering and at times hopeless world. The world still needs a Savior more than ever. The world needs Jesus, the Messiah. So my friends, don't give up. For the days are surely coming, Jeremiah said. The prophet still declares to us today, don't give up. The days are surely coming. And so this Advent, we live, wait, and hope for the days that are surely coming as we remember the hope that was born in Jesus, in Bethlehem. You know, we hear the Christmas story told every single year. But we forget. We forget what it was really like before that first Christmas what it was like before Jesus came. Imagine yourselves in the sandals of the shepherds who got the message of Bethlehem first. Their religious life was much different than ours. Faith was much more about following laws and making sacrifices. All this to pay the price for breaking of the laws. It was an endless cycle. Try to follow laws that were impossible to follow, break the laws, then make payment for your sins through offerings and sacrifices. Never being good enough. Never being able to live up to the law. Always falling short. Feeling hopeless. Can you imagine how tired and how defeated, how desperate, how hopeless one could feel always coming up short forever, having to pay your way forward Frustrating, yes, but there was hope. Jeremiah wrote about the great hope that they had in God's faithfulness. They would not have to make sacrifices forever. Soon there would come the Messiah who would never lack, Jeremiah says. The throne will never be empty and the debt will forever be paid upon the coming of this Messiah. And this is the hope that the shepherds had in their hearts that night when the angels appeared and gave them that message of hope. The Savior has been born. No more. He's coming. He's here. 
No more, he's coming soon, hold on. No, he's here. Can you imagine the excitement? Can you imagine the hope, the anticipation, the excitement as they ran to Bethlehem to see what God had done? Our shepherds were overflowing with hope and joy because of what it meant for them, because of what it means for us. The Messiah has been born. Hope, in the grand way of thinking of hope, had begun. This is how it is for all of us, really. This message is the summary for what Christmas is all about. All the hope of the coming Messiah hinges on the true purpose for the coming of the Messiah. Freedom. Freedom by grace and mercy. When we're free, we have hope. So as we begin our journey to Bethlehem this Advent, let us remember this hope as those who did not take this gift for granted. Let us look to the baby in the manger through the eyes of a shepherd gazing on the Lord for the first time, fully understanding what a huge fulfillment of hope the baby Jesus represents. And let us look forward to Christmas with that same hope in our hearts. Let us know the true meaning of the angel's words when she declared, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. It is our Christ, our Savior, our Lord, our Jesus who awaits us in Bethlehem. It is to him that we will journey these coming weeks, getting closer and closer to Bethlehem and our certain hope found in Jesus. So my friends, may your hearts be filled with the great hope of expectation as we venture forward. My friends, it is Advent again, 2020, but our hope has already come in Jesus. Good news. Good news for you, for me, and the whole world. Let us pray. Jesus, you are good news. Because we need hope, and in you is our certain hope. One for us at the cross. Jesus, you faithfully following God's design, came to earth, walked the talk all the way to the cross to the empty tomb, to now dwelling in heaven, where you promised to create a place for each of us and welcome us home in your timing. So in this Christmas season, oh God, fill us with that hope. And as the wreath comes to full glory, may we experience all you intend in the hope and the peace and the joy and love found in your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.
The Thanksgiving season moves right into the Advent and Christmas season. It reminds us that gratitude is a wonderful way to begin to think of giving. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. And that doesn't just mean we get higher points for giving. It means it actually does something to us as we give, something positive and life fulfilling. So as we give today, let's give generously. Let's give because Christ has given to us. I invite you to give now. So let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have been so generous to us. You've shown your love to us by giving yourself to us. So now bless us as we give part of ourselves, part of our resources to make a difference in the world. Bless these offerings we give, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you were with us in worship. I hope that as you begin your week, you will take this, this idea of hope with you. But before I share our closing benediction, I just want to give you a really important invitation. Following this service, directly following this service, we're going to have an Advent hymn sing. It's Kathy Rodlin, our organist, who's going to share some history about some hymns and then invite us to listen or sing some Advent hymns. One of the hymns is Light Dawns in a Weary World. It might be worth it just to show up to hear that hymn of how God brings light into the midst of a weary world. How God brings light into our weary world. So right after this service, just stay put and you'll have an opportunity to be a part of this Advent hymn sing with Kathleen Rodlin. So my friends, as we, as we head out today, we, the Advent wreath is becoming illuminated. The light of hope is now projected forward for us. Jesus came to this world to offer us hope, a hope well beyond ourselves, a hope that offers expectation of today and the days to come. The expectation that God will be with us, that God is with us, and that God will never never leave us or forsake us. We live as people of hope. I invite you to do so as well. 
Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. I'd like to invite you to join me in singing five Advent hymns that are new to us, all featured in the hymnal Glory to God. Three of these hymns have texts which are set to much older tunes, the first of which should be very familiar to us. The other two hymns have new text and a new tune, and they were written to be done together. And all five have an important message for us, words of hope, words of welcome. I hope you will listen several times and get to know these hymns. Follow the texts and the melodies, or even harmony if you so choose. But most importantly, read these texts and use them as you prepare your hearts for Christ's coming. O oh Lord, how shall I meet you? Though many Advent hymns addressed Christ with entreaty and invitation, this more contemplative text considers how an individual prepares for and responds to Christ's coming. It also brings together a recollection of the first coming with an anticipation of the second coming. The tune is a familiar one, used for the Palm Sunday hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. The text is Paul Gerhardt from 1653, which has been translated by Catherine Winkler. <laughs>
light dawns on a weary world. This is a hymn whose tune came first. Upon hearing it, the author recalled the watered garden of Isaiah 58:11, which in turn led to Isaiah 55:12, paraphrased in the refrain. Then came the stanzas, organized around their first two words, light dawns, love grows, hope blooms. This is a new hymn tune composed by William Rowan in 2000 and text by Mary Louise Bringle in 2001. My soul cries out with a joyful shout, Canticle of the Turning. By employing an energetic Irish folk song for his melody, this ballad-like paraphrase of the Magnificat, Mary's song of her meeting with her relative Elizabeth, Luke 1, verses 46 to 55, recaptures both the wonder and the faith of this young woman who first recognized what God was doing. The text and the melody are adapted by Rory Cooney in 1990.
Now the heavens start to whisper. This Advent text artfully interweaves what is hidden and what is revealed, primarily in the coming of the long-awaited Messiah. But Christ himself taught us about another hidden truth, his presence in the least of these, Matthew 25, 40 and 45, who we are also called to welcome. Again, text is by Mary Louise Bringle, and the tune comes from the Tennessee Harmony of 1818, matching new text to much older music. Awake, awake, and greet the new morn. After attending a carol concert, the author and composer of this hymn was moved to create a contemporarily accessible carol that drew on the familiar images in a new way. There are echoes here of passages such as Isaiah 9, 6, Isaiah 7, 4, Matthew 1, 23, Isaiah 35, 5, and 6, and Isaiah 2, verse 4. The text and the music are both by Marty Haugen, and this one you may recognize because we did it last year for Advent. Uh -huh. 